my purpose and my desire is to help people to see the emotions that they have, especially those that we condemn, fear, anxiety, insecurity, powerlessness, as an opportunity and not as a punishment or a weakness. And so this is how I came to what I'm doing now <laughs> since yeah, 20 years. <laughs> yeah, since 20 years. And I think in your story, what really fascinated me, and you just said it right at the beginning, you know, um, uh, I was basically born as we all are, we are babies and we are quite ourselves. We are authentic. And then we start growing up and growing up is perhaps nothing else, but being told what to do, how to behave in society, what is the right way, the wrong way. And then also living up to certain expectations. Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share. Together, we find our way. Welcome back to another episode here on Mentory TV. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Patricia Falco Becali, your host, and you are here because you are staying curious. That's the tagline of our show. If you stay curious, you have a way to expand, to learn, to get absolutely illuminated and get also the benefit of our great guests here on Mentory TV. Today, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Friedemann entire name, Dr. Friedemann Schaub, but Dr. Friedemann is known as Dr. Friedemann. He just came out with his second book, The Empowerment Solution. First book was called The, the, uh, the Fear and Anxiety Solution. And here, basically, he's looking at how you can overcome anxiety, overcome the feeling of feeling powerless and kind of reclaim the power you actually never really gave away because it's inside of you and all of that without medication. I think that is more or less the essence of what we are going to talk about. Apart from being here on Mentory TV, let me just brag a little bit about him. He's been featured on Oprah Magazine, Huffington Post, Shape, Teen Vogue, Nature Medicine, Reader's Digest. He's an MD and of course has his PhD. Dr. Friedemann, thank you so much for being with us here on Mentory TV. Well, so excited to be here. Thank you. Well, listen, um, as you say, as everybody says, mm, I think I went slightly overboard on your book. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love it. Uh, and um, I suggest to everybody to have a look, not only at the book, but the book makes you have a look at yourself. And I think this is what the journey was that I really, really enjoyed in reading it. Before we get into, you know, the structure of the book and all of your fantastic techniques, you know, recognitions and techniques, you talk about how we can reclaim the power we never really lost, is tell us a bit about you yourself and what actually brought you, Dr. Friedemann, to the point that we are here now talking about your second book when it comes to uh, anxiety and overcoming that as an issue. Well, I think I went exactly on this journey that uh, I think a lot of people are on, which is the journey of losing yourself along the way, believing that you have to be somewhere or somehow or something that you're told to be. And I was told to be a physician because my parents were physicians. My sister is a physician. And so I just stepped into the same path. I was also told that I'm not very smart, so I had to do extra work in order to even go to that level. And, and that brought up a lot of anxiety for me, a lot of insecurity, a lot of um, I have to prove myself energy. And as I was living in this survival mode of always having to battle my uh, anxiety and my limitations, I more and more lost myself along the way. And it was when I was uh, in cardiology, waking up in the middle of the night and feeling lost, feeling, okay, I have a panic attack because a voice inside of me is hammering down the fact that you want to really live like this for another 30 years. And just the thought of it didn't feel very appealing. Not that I didn't like to be a physician, but it wasn't really what I was supposed to do. It just didn't feel that I was helping people the way I wanted to help them. And then I was was a mandatory in our university hospital to go into a research lab. So for two years, I went to the US. Out of two years, went 16 years because I really enjoyed doing research and uh, became a molecular biologist. But there I really discovered that 
you know, medicine is kind of a little bit lying to us because they tell us we have no power, we have no abilities, we need the doctors to fix or to get fixed. But in the end, it really is that we have miracles happening inside of us in each and every cell of us every day. It's unbelievable what what just cells are able to do. And I became more and more fascinated by that. So I went to the different track, research track. And as I was on that track after seven years, I once again decided it's not really totally in alignment with myself because I don't wake up passionate. I don't feel like this is really what I'm here to do. And this is where everything came full circle. I realized that what I really love doing since I was a child is listening and helping people to just bring out the truth. And I did this as a child when I was uh, with my mom uh, visiting patients because she always went to the you know little towns and the, the farmers and I talked to the family, even as a boy, people said to me, what, what, I don't know why I'm telling you this. You're just a kid. And how is it possible that I'm telling you all my secrets? So there was something that I just always felt intrigued by and uh, able to do. And, and so I decided this is how I can help people best, helping them with the one thing we all struggle with, which is our emotions. We are not told how to deal with anxiety when we grow up. Boys are told they shouldn't cry. Don't be so sensitive. We are not explained that the emotions are valuable tools. We are pretty much overriding our emotions left and right and only focused on that intellectual part of our brain. Yeah. And that is why so many people are struggling with emotions. And I saw in cardiology how many emotional struggles led to physical struggles and just uh, my purpose and my desire is to help people to see the emotions that they have, especially those that we condemn, fear, anxiety, insecurity, powerlessness, as an opportunity and not as a punishment or a weakness. And so this is how I came to what I'm doing now yeah, <laughs> since yeah. 20 years. <laughs> yeah, since 20 years. And I think in your story, what really fascinated me, and you just said it right at the beginning, you know, um, uh, I was basically born as we all are, we are babies and we are quite ourselves. We are authentic. And then we start growing up and growing up is perhaps nothing else, but being told what to do, how to behave in society, what is the right way, the wrong way, and then also living up to certain expectations. What I thought was interesting, the dissonance you mentioned straight away. So your parents expected you to be physicians, okay? Medical doctors, which usually stands for, I am smart guys. Okay, and I can study, I can remember, I can research, I can heal you. Hmm? But at the same time, they said, you're not very smart. I mean, this kind of, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's a conflict right there, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so, so this kind of conflict, of course, what, what did that trigger in you? Well, I mean, this is where we compensate for the beliefs that are imprinted on us and my belief of not being smart enough or good enough, I compensated for by becoming an overachiever and trying to always prove myself. But ultimately what I was hiding and what I'm writing in the book also about the invisibility pattern, what I was hiding was my vulnerability. What I was hiding was my anxiety. I didn't admit to people that I had anxiety. I didn't tell my parents that I had OCD. I didn't go to a psychologist or psychiatrist with my issues. I was hiding those weaknesses that I saw as weaknesses. And so I was achieving on the one hand, but I was always driven by a fear of failure, by a fear of disappointing others. And I think a lot of people can relate to this. I mean, yes. people that are extremely successful, extremely, you know, just having uh, achieved anything that they want, Deep inside, they often feel there is a void, so there is a hole, there is a lack that no matter what success they have, no matter how much they amiss, can ever be filled. And I felt exactly the same way. And this is this powerlessness somehow, somehow within us, it's somehow being instilled. And you talk in your book very much about not only anxiety, but also the inner child and the subconscious mind. And I think that is something that a lot of people are not aware of. And we'll talk about self-awareness as well. And again, what 
intrigued me uh, in your story is as you were just describing how your professional journey went, that somehow you were in a certain professional environment, did something even for years, and all of a sudden realizing it's still not me. It's still not me. So this level of self-awareness actually always took you, despite your success, uh, to take a step back and evaluate yourself, self-aware of, is this really me? Why am I doing this again? Who for? If I'm getting up and I'm actually not really passionate about what I'm doing. Well, and that is a gift of anxiety. That's a gift of emotions. When you have emotions that show you despite every accolade and despite all the money you're making, you're not happy. There is actually a, you know, kind of a nervousness and an underlying current of uh, dissatisfaction inside of you. Obviously, something is not right. Intellectually, no one understood. Why did you leave medicine? Everything was laid out for you. You would be a professor and whatever. Others said, you know, why did you leave research? You already had a grant. You know, you were really well taken care of intellectually did not make any sense but if i would have not made this decision i would be either you know a professor with two heart attacks and probably you know 100 kilos or more or i would be a researcher who just feels you know beaten down because it just was not really anything fulfilling for me i did a lot of animal research which i really didn't like but of course you're forced to do this and yeah, so there, there are these things where you just realize later on the anxiety, all these emotions I had that I didn't like, but they came up over and over. They were really important navigators, guides that got me on the right track. It is for us, though, so difficult to not combat and not fight the emotions because we are told those are what hold you back. It's your anxiety that holds you back. Is this sadness that we call depression that holds you back. It's the stress that you just have to medicate yourself with. And, and those things are unfortunately important messengers that we are kind of, you know, suppressing and they are opportunities that we're not taking. Yeah. Isn't depression and anxiety not already the result of suppressed or, um, let's say, yeah, suppressed emotions that we all have and they come up and we don't really know how to deal with? I think depression can have two you know, causes. One is the exhaustion of living in anxiety and stress. And despite all your efforts, you never really feel any peace. So at some point, it's almost like you're shutting down, you're going inwards and you're going into a more state of paralysis. The other is when you are really literally having so much pressure that is not only pressure from the outside, but also pressure from the inside uh, expectations and, uh, you know, just uh, ideas of what you should be that you're not, that fills you literally up with so much energy that it's too hard to carry and too difficult to move on. This is again an exhaustion. But often when I talk to people about depression and I say, what is the pressure that you actually have been feeling in your life? And what is the pressure that you have been holding on inside of you? It is like a light bulb moment. They always saw depression more as, oh, well, this is a sadness or a biochemical imbalance. But then they realize, no, there, there is something that started it. There were thoughts, there were beliefs, there were actions or non-actions. And all of this led me into this feeling of being depressed, which is the ultimate feeling of powerlessness. Yeah. And the interesting thing, there is Dr. Gabo Mate. I'm quite sure that you're familiar with him. And mm -hmm. he's kind of a trauma expert going through his own trauma. And I think he landed where he, he is because he needed to look at his own trauma and how to overcome it. And then right. went, went down the road. And he basically um, okay. talks a lot about what you also talk about, the subconscious mind. And um, he takes it basically from the state of when we are children. You know, in the first seven years, so Bruce Lipton says that the first seven years we just download as children. We are passive because we're creating basically our mosaic of experiences where we then have the context one day to really evaluate. But until then, we just take in. So I took in from my parents certain comments, be it about my body, be it about my behavior, be it out whatever, whatever, creating certain beliefs. And I don't know about your parents, but my parents definitely did not mean any harm to me. 
none of the parents really out there, unless they're <laughs> under drugs or whatever, does mean harm to children. But you do harm. And somehow, somewhere, be it emotional or physical, or just as a witness, we get injured. We have a wound. It can be called trauma, but trauma is always kind of like, whoa. But it leaves some sort of imprint. And it's something we remember that made us feel bad, sad. And we then try to kind of avoid and kind of go like, okay, how can we overcome this? And then we get to the survival patterns that you talk about as well. Would you would you take us through this, especially how we have to, and you write about the subconscious, a what the subconscious really is for our viewers to really understand where to position it and how to kind of the subconscious being created and what it wants to do for us, with us, and how we have to kind of perhaps modify it with our own life now. You know, Einstein said that we are only using 10% of our potential, of our capacity. And I think uh, what he was referring to was probably the subconscious mind, because we are not really using the subconscious mind. We are using our 10% of our conscious mind, the rational intellectual mind, and let the subconscious mind do its thing, because we don't really know how to communicate. But when we really look at what the subconscious mind is doing, 70 to 80% of our daily activities are run by the subconscious, including our bodily functions, habits, things that we do automatically by not even thinking, brushing teeth, you know, eating, not even, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Emotions are rooted in the subconscious. And you mentioned the first seven years, you know, the first seven years, especially the subconscious says, well, sorry, you're not very, you know, developed yet. So I need to take over and I'm going to be your nanny and I'm going to make sense out of everything that happens. And so if you get neglected, if you get shamed, if you get punished, if you get abused, I, the subconscious say, here is what we're going to do. A, we're going to understand your position in the world. B, we're going to understand what the world is all about. And then we're going to decide what we're going to do about it so that we're going to survive. So let's, for example, say you have been neglected, then you may have in the belief system, well, I guess I'm not unconditionally lovable. I must be not really, you know, good enough. So I have two choices to get what I want. Either I'm going to become the pleaser and I'm going to be the good boy, good girl and make sure everyone likes me, which, you know, stays with you for a long time, or I'm just going to uh, accept that I cannot have what I want. So I'm just going to make myself smaller and uh, invisible so that I don't get hurt. And, and we all have gone through these kind of survival patterns at different phases early in our lives. It doesn't have to be the patterns, uh, the parents, it can be uh, the kids in school, you have your two best friends, and all of a sudden, they don't talk to you anymore. And then again, the subconscious says, Oh, whoa, you can be rejected. How do we avoid this from happening in the future? The problem is that we are having these patterns run not only for the first seven years, they keep on running throughout entire life until we are changing them. They're not always on the surface because we are developing different roles and personalities. What I see very often is that people can take on a role of a you know parent who's really loving and caring or a role of a, you know a successful entrepreneur. And they are in the adult empowered place. But as soon as they are back home, for example, and mom makes a comment that may be a criticism, that subconscious survival pattern gets triggered immediately. And then they are shrinking or they are worrying or they are pleasing. Or as soon as they are at home hearing the brother or sister bragging about their success, they feel not good enough. They feel ashamed just like they did when they were 10 years old or seven years old. So the triggers will still be able to activate the patterns and the insecurities. And that is what a lot of people are struggling with. They don't understand how can I be so good with my children at my work? And how can I feel so low and insecure in these other settings? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and the interesting part seems to be that within that survival pattern, they actually feel safe because this is what they started to learn that if the subconscious mind takes over, being in the mode of avoider or pleaser, somehow it will get me through. So you kind of are thrown back into something that needs updating. 
Exactly, exactly. And that's a writing of the owner's manual, rewriting it from this is what worked as a child, this is what was necessary when I was little, but now let's rewrite it so that it brings me out of the survival mode into a more thriving state, into more joy and purpose, so that we are congruent. See, I wrote this book for two reasons. One is to help people to not feel so powerless and you know, you talk about anxiety, but I think people can be in survival mode without anxiety. They just don't have the most resourceful way of going through life, whether it's they're procrastinating constantly, whether they are you know, in a place where they basically become like the chameleon, that they're fitting in everywhere, but never found their own self. But the other reason why I wrote this is we are really facing as a world uh, a crisis in faith. We don't really know anymore what and who to believe in. And you see it in the extreme in the US right now, where there's just this big divide, but you see it in other places as well. And where even science get questions, where, where you know, things that are about human decency will be just uh, tossed aside because you know being in power, being right is more important. And we are looking so much for outside answers and direction and meaning, and we're not looking inside anymore. Why? Because we avoid ourselves. We avoid ourselves because it doesn't feel good to be with ourselves. It's like being with a stranger and you don't really know what to talk about. You don't feel comfortable in your own skin because you don't really know who you are. You're not or... connected. You're not connected exactly. to yourself. Totally disconnected. And if I may, That's just it. yeah. And and there's so much to unpack in what you just said. You know, today's society. Let's let's just pick up on this one. And I was thinking about it. You know, these days, of course, through technology, which is a, I'm I'm total technology buff. I love technology. Okay, but it's a tool, and a lot of people think it's not a tool, but it's their life. You know, it's a toy and what yeah. have you. Um, is that basically, I think people these days, they don't have midlife crisis anymore. They have quarter life crisis because <laughs> this, do you know what I mean? I mean, they, they go through life and already we are from our childhood often don't feel lovable enough, enough in our performance. And we come home with a B plus. Why is it not an A? You know, you're maybe a bit curvy. Ha, huh? you are fat and what have you with all of this. And now, through the social media as well you constantly feel oh my god she's this and that and this and that, all of all at the same time you know yes. and we feel constantly bombarded with messages but it's actually not messages it is trigger 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 again we are not enough we're actually worse because everybody else seems to be not only enough but overflowing so i think this is very much an underlying sickness potentially in our society and that is really also what is rocking the boat what you also talk about is is you know the value set that we have because feeling or creating a belief on something that is not enough yourself and then falling into a world constantly again making everything that actually is not really human as in a human value a value also makes you feel unworthy or even worse so how are you supposed to really create a decent set of values well and when you're just describing the scenario you can also say well without values and without connection to yourself naturally you feel scared because who do you trust in? Who do you lean on? Who is there for you? And again, unsafe. Some, again, you're yes. being unsafe. Again, anxiety trigger, right? Exactly. And that's, you know, we know anxiety is a pandemic of the 21st century. And, and that is certainly one reason this disconnect and this constantly looking for outside validation or outside guidance or all the things we have to avoid to be or to, to be seen as it's it's a constant race it's a constant running away and ultimately we're running away from ourselves and and so going inwards and and really finding these tracks that lead you back to yourself these are the keys i describe these six keys to empowerment and they are you know for example there's the key of self-awareness it's a very very important key that's like the the, the basis no yes the awareness is that you're not swallowed up in your own crap basically but you're kind of like whoa let me just evaluate myself. Self-awareness. Talk to it. Yeah. Talk to us. Well, about you know, I just remember when I was zero aware and I went to parties and I 
didn't even know what to talk about. So, you know, I introduced myself as a doctor, not with my name. It's like, oh my God, what happened with this guy? And then, you know, I, I was That's so- That's a show off, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a show off because that was the only thing I had as a form of identity. All the rest, I really didn't know. And and then I found myself at some point in a, in a church because I thought, well, maybe here I can find clarity. I find some sense and, uh, well, I didn't. But it showed me you're looking for something. You, you have to find yourself again. There is just a, a deep hole, a void inside of you and something that you know you cannot gain from the outside, not through more papers writing, not through more pats on the back from your boss. This is something that you really have to be self-responsible. So that journey in started at that time. And, and self-awareness has many layers to it. And, you know, we mentioned values and values and inner qualities are often uh, connected. You know, what do you really know is one of your gifts and your strengths and just, you know, being able to dissect it and understand it. Just like I mentioned at the beginning, this this gift of being able to talk to people and listen and and then decipher what's really going on. That's something I was given since birth. And that's a strength that I had totally forgotten about. And so we all have to have this uh, opportunity and take it to, to go inside and look for your little treasures, because that's what we're ultimately here to share with the world. Exactly. And you talk about self-compassion as well, which I thought, you know, compassion, I really had to go, okay, I need to look up the definition again about compassion, you know, because, because it is, you know, a lot of people understand perhaps different uh, things uh, uh, with that word. And self-compassion is something that not necessarily something you're raised with. And, you know, there's so many things that you say and that you went through in your life that resonate with me. You said, you know, two of these survival loops, uh, survival modes is um, to be uh, a voider or a pleaser. I was both, if you can be both. OK, because I was um, an, uh, a pleaser because I was such a wild child. You you describe yourself as go happy, go lucky, just like I'm cool the way I am. And I was so crazy, absolute verrückt, as they say in German. And my parents would say, well, of course, you don't have friends if you're like that all the time. And they would just say I wouldn't have friends. And it was natural because I was just the way I was. And I really actually mm -hmm. liked the way I was because I was crazy. I was always curious. I did everything, tried everything. If it went great, if it didn't go well, great as well. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't really matter. And the other thing is that my mom, en passant, my mom was always overweight, always. So I grew up with a with a uh, an overweight mother, and and at some point I came home and somebody and you know when you're in puberty and you start developing your curves and uh, a guy commented on me saying, "Oh, you're going, you're getting a bit feminine." And I didn't know how to take this. Coming home, I say to my mom, "Guess what? I was told this today. I must have been maybe." 12, 13. And she said, Oh my God, of course, you're going to be fat like me one day. How not? You're my daughter. Okay. And this is when the avoider came. So from, you mm. know, from, 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 you are absolutely too crazy for anybody to like you because you're right. just so full of energy. You could, people can't take this. And then, of course, you're going to be fat. There, the avoider came in. I'm not. I'm going to avoid everything that would cause me ever to get fat like you, because I don't find it aesthetically. I mean, everybody can do whatever, but it wasn't working for me. And I thought it was unhealthy as well. And I was into ballet. So, and so I was both. Yeah? So you also, you were happy go lucky, but something happened that you kind of was, yeah. a little, you were a little bit more strategic about how you had to be in order to fit in, to fill up, to be enough. I think we do have both, most of us, and most of us actually run all those patterns I'm describing. Some dominate more than others, but yes, it makes total sense. You know, often the avoider is first. In your case, it was a little bit later, but often when you do feel like you have no power, it's easier just to disappear or avoid danger than, you know, really face it. And so when you're older, then you go more into the pleaser mode because you feel like, well, I do have a little bit of a ability to sense what people want me to be or do what, you know, is appropriate. And that's a little bit more of an, you know, mature way of responding. It doesn't make it any better because it's a lot of power that you are seemingly giving away to others because you're so dependent 
and their it. approval and their feedback. And that's it. That's it. And the, and and this is this uh, dependency on other people. That is when you give your power away. You're right. Right. The moment you value somebody else's opinion about you or what you do more, if you follow more somebody else's advice than your gut instinct, this is the moment you actually feel powerless and stay powerless. And that is when you have to pivot. Right. 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 And. You know, the, the goal is for you when you coming back to self-awareness is to really understand what are the beliefs and the imprints that make me even on this avoider or pleaser track that kept me there. And and how do I want to see myself and the world differently? And that is all semi-conscious, subconscious. But one of the pieces in the book uh, when it comes to self-awareness is really reconnecting with something that is not intellectual, that is not conscious. and and that's a little tricky by reading the book. This is why I offer people that bought the book to go actually and download the meditation that is guided uh, by me and with me. Oh, yeah, no, your podcast is fantastic. I saw all your videos. Really, really good. It's uh, I mean, everybody yeah. go on Dr. Friedman podcast. This is uh, great clips, great length <laughs> and really very, very uh, understandable and applicable. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a, a meditation that you can go back to your, I call it essence. Mm -hmm. And what I mean with essence is that what I was looking for in that church, that this is who you are. You may not be able to put it in words. You may not be able to even, you know, describe it to anyone, but you can feel it. It's like this inner center of gravity. And, and we know this from other people, you know, we can see, I don't know, when you love someone dearly, you can feel their essence, you can know who they are, and you can distinguish it from anybody else, because that's uniqueness. And it doesn't have to be anything that they express. It's more like something that is their truth. It's, you know, the signature energy. And, and how much time do we spend looking for this? None. So there is a process that I describe in the book that leads you back to this. And it's it's metaphorical in many ways because it is about rewinding and peeling off all these overlays that you described, your overlay of imprints, you know, negative messages, ideas of what's appropriate and what's not, and, and going back to your origin of self. And if you really go to the origin of cells, and if you look at, at babies, for example, and see like, that is the personality. That's a personality that comes out and right away say, I have a right to scream. I had a right to demand attention. I'm hungry, my diaper is full, and I tell you so, and I know someone is supposed to be here. There is a power and a confidence in that that just continues to evolve. And, and there is something inside of us that we are losing a connection to ourselves, a connection to our birthright to be who we are, that we can reclaim. And that is what this self-awareness chapter is about. Absolutely. And I think you also refer in your book to the question, who am I? Now, I'm sure that everybody at some point in their life has gone, come to that question, who am I? But I don't think too many people then actually came up with the answer <laughs> because it does take confidence. You just mentioned confidence is a big part of the equation. And what I thought was very interesting in your book was how you describe this survival pattern. So there's the victim, there's the, the one that hides the invisibility, the procrastinate, you say, the chameleon, the helper, the lover. And then on the other side, you say, hey, a victim needs to pick up self-responsibility. The, the invisibility guy has to have a bit of self-compassion. Procrastinator has to have a bit of reliance. Now, I think this is, these are fantastic tools, but I wonder what made you and me as well really have that confidence to say, geez, I cannot anymore. I need to find who, my truth. And if I have to look inside and it's really, really ugly, often it is, because otherwise, why would the subconscious try to protect us from ourselves so that we even develop anxiety for being anxious or anxiety to fall back into an addiction that used to be one of those patterns, perhaps, to, to deal with uh, horrible emotions? And and I, I just want to know what really can be the pivot to say, just continue down the path, ask yourself, um, or does everybody, is everybody only ready when all of a sudden at night you kind of wake up out of deep sleep and say, no, no, I need to change now, you know, which can also happen that the, that, that, that your subconscious is kind of like pushing you in pain, in whatever to just say, stop, or you start becoming suicidal. 
I don't think that I did it right or ideal because I always find changing, you know, your external environment. I mean, I left Europe, I changed my career several times just to find something that's kind of the, you know, inverse way of doing it, because ultimately you're just stabbing in the dark and you're trying something else and hoping it's going to make you better. It's like the person who feels unlovable and changes always their partners and hoping that this is going to make me feel better. But no, no partner going to fill this void. So ideally, you're going to find yourself and connect to all those keys and then reevaluate your life. You don't have to be in so much pain or so much anxiety like I was and then say, OK, what are I going to do next? What really brings me joy? Start to just accept that this is right now what you do. That's your canvas. This is your environment. But spend some more time with yourself. And the amazing thing is that two things can happen. You may actually change a lot or you completely change how you see it, how you feel about it, your attitude about it, and you make it so much better, even though nothing externally really changes. So those two things can, so it's not, transformation doesn't mean that you have to throw your life upside down. It just means that you become the creator of your reality rather than feeling that your life is done to you and you just have to buckle up and somehow live through it. Yeah, I like this. this uh, life uh, happens to you. And I always uh, think life happens for you. But it didn't dawn on me like this. That is something I had to learn. Otherwise, that is kind of like the, the pivot in how you try to see things. And I think, you know, for me, Kabbalah, for example, ha is one of those tools that helped me to, to have this approach. But what I thought, let, let's go a little bit backwards, because you also had this, you know, your dad for a long time was still a trigger for you. So even as an adult, he'd come and he'd criticize you. And whilst as, you know, before your, your self-empowerment for yourself and that freedom you created, this was a trigger and you might have just gone through the roof. OK, now you can deal with it. And I think this is something that also uh, in this process, I find very important to know that like with addiction, once addicted, always addicted. Yeah. Once you had these kind of, uh, you know, childhood traumas, the subconscious, even though it's rewritten, it's not that it is forgotten. Uh, it's not forgotten. And I wonder, you also talk about um, forgiveness. Because when I found out, or when I also saw my parents that victimized everybody for where they were, okay, especially my mm -hmm. father, he is responsible for them because I, because of him, I can't do this, that, yada, yada, yada. And I always thought, Jesus, you know, grow, not grow up, be a father, be a man. And it, it really, and it was, I was, I was small like this. I'm going like, okay, dad, you know, just keep it together, you know, please, sir, you know, keep it together. It will be all right. This moment of forgiveness, because you also at some point, had to look back and say, Jesus, the reason why I'm doing all this odyssey is something that my parents, even they didn't do it on purpose, did to me. But you have to kind of let go to really set free. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned trauma, which, as you said, it's a big word these days. But I do think that trauma will not stay with you if you see trauma as fundamentally the confusion of the mind, especially the subconscious, still trying to figure out why. Was it something I did wrong? Was it something that person is responsible for? How could I have prevented it from happening? There are a lot of unanswered questions. And similar to anxiety, we are focusing so much on the wound and the symptoms, and we're not really asking or listening to the questions that are asked. And I think that's something that I find when you have been triggered by your father, for example, and you really understand, like many of us, <laughs> and you really understand that, okay, this is actually something that in my and myself and my subconscious was bringing up all these questions. Is he right? Can I not trust myself? Is what he's saying really a reflection on who I am? And answering all these questions was really, really helpful for me to ultimately forgive him. Not that, you know, I was a judge sitting there and say, okay, no punishment for you. It was more like that I could disentangle myself from his opinion and realize all of what he was saying was coming from his own fears because he had a whole you know baggage that he was carrying around since many years since he grew up and in seeing this more and having compassion for his fears and understanding that everything i'm doing would be unthinkable for him to do it was just 
impossible for him to imagine changing a career, leaving the country, starting you, doing your own business with, you know, something that just is uh, unusual. Those were things that's caused him to be triggered. And these triggers were, you know, something that he then saw as, you know, oh my God, this is not safe. So then he projected this feeling of unsafety on me. And of course, I want approval and I want, you know, applause and I want not necessarily doubt and worry. And I took it on until I didn't anymore, until I had this shield of compassion around me. And, and thank God I had it 10 years before he died, because we had actually the last 10 years uh, very peaceful and Beautiful. I could smile and I could uh, reassure him and I didn't take it personal. And I also know or I knew he's not my guide. And at some point, we have to accept that we cannot see our parents any longer as these uber mensch that just, you know, knows everything. And we still want to have something from them. At some point, we just have to accept ways have been passed. Maybe we were, you know, evolving beyond them. Maybe mm. we just know better what's right for us than they do. We just have to accept that there is a shift in the relationship. And that's what the forgiveness process in the book certainly helped me with. Mm. And and did you ever talk to him about this in the last 10 years? Well, I did talk about, you know, how it was hard for me when I went even now to my second career and he didn't talk for me for a while with me for a while because he was so shocked and and I asked him if he was proud of me and he was actually very proud of me and uh, you know, that was as far as it went. He didn't take responsibility. He didn't necessarily talk about, you know, why he did this. But I understood that this was really something that, and this is an interesting process in the book, negative thoughts, turning them into questions. And when I realized when my dad said something, oh, you should do this or this, or you should be careful with this. When I turn it into a question, like more, are you sure that this is the right thing? Are you having or have you considered this as a possible problem? It was so much easier to handle because I can answer questions. It's not a statement. It's not the truth. It's just a question. And that helped me then also internally when I had any kind of worry echoes in my mind, just phrasing them as questions and then giving the answer. And it's a wonderful way to find reassurance inside of yourself. I agree, Dr. Friedman. I think, uh, you know, questions in itself, whatever they are, first of all, they give you power because you're asking somebody to come up with an answer. Yeah. Even if it is just, you know, a question to yourself, but somehow it em empowers. And also Dr. Daniel Amen talks about where, you know, about is it true? There's always the first question. He says, if you have a automatic negative thought, the ants, he calls them, okay, they creep up in your mind. And then the way to distance yourself according to his own own uh, path is to just say hey is it true what you're saying are you really going to be fat are you really unlike because you're wild are you really you know going to be a disaster because you're happy go lucky and you just smile and you know it's not not very manly maybe or what is expected as a little boy all yeah, right um that i think is a superb tool and also coming back you know my path with my parents was first of all before i could forgive because that was i think forgiveness is something that is hugely mature until you know you really get to not only disentanglement but really it's okay moment is is a long way i my journey was through appreciation because at some point i appreciated my parents I went through the victim as well because of my parents, you know, this and that and this and that. I just thought, Jesus, thanks to my parents, I became exactly the opposite mm. to what I had. So, you know, as a child, I think you are you are faced with either you're going to be like your tribe or you're going to be your own tribe. And I decided at some point I'm going to create my own, you know, dynasty. And it yeah. starts with me. Huh? Yeah. So I was going through appreciation when I said, thank God my mom was so obese because I will never be. And I'm super healthy. Yes, it is a burden, but it's a good one. You know, I'm hopefully going to live 111 years, which is my, my target. And thank God my dad went through his trauma at work and victimizing everybody because that is certainly a self-responsibility for me is question. You know, something goes wrong. Okay, so what could I have done better? Where can I pick up the slack? What happened? And in Kabbalah, for example, you say, if you point the finger, remember, three fingers point towards you, which I thought was off and, and one to God. But anyway, so which I thought was, was awfully interesting as well. But forgiveness as such came later. 
when I just thought I was okay. When I was really saying, okay, now I am actually so connected to myself, found that crazy girl again, she's out, okay, and found the, you know, the, the lust for whatever I eat is okay, it's going to be okay, you know, it's not regulated anymore, then I could forgive, but it was more about me being okay to forgive rather than just to say, I'm still not okay, but I forgive you. I don't know if that Absolutely. makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. And you know what you say about appreciation is basically, you know, what I write in the book about that we are all teachers and students of each other. And so you just took the responsibility to say, I want to learn from the examples of my parents. And even though they were the opposite of what I want to be, they were examples that guided me that I could learn from. And you gave your parents also opportunity to learn from you. Some parents do, some parents don't. But you did your job. So if it's a, you know, a, a sole contract as to speak uh, between people that come together, that we always can grow from each other, you did your best and they did their best. And forgiveness is really not about neutralizing all emotions. Forgiveness is simply just saying, OK, right now I'm taking responsibility for my journey and I take responsibility for me to get everything that I learned from this. And I'm not tying myself through resentment or this long you owe me sheet or feeling still I'm holding my breath for them to be different. I'm simply letting go, giving away all of this. Doesn't mean that I talk to them, doesn't mean I feel you know that I need to be close to them, just means that I'm not burdened by this relationship anymore. And that reset often then also transpires into better relationships or more peaceful relationships. And what I love about you say about forgiveness, you say at some point in the book, you say, if you don't forgive, ultimately you hurt yourself. And it is so true because you're still carrying something that is in the past. And whilst you're carrying it in the present, it hence creates your future. And then it's just the same old, same old. And this is where we're coming back into the loop, right? So if you don't do something in this moment, the loop will continue. And the same thing is if you don't forgive and you're holding that grudge and you're thinking, they're not thinking about you anymore, but you're still there. You're still right. living. You know, I was talking to Dr. Um, David Hanscom, who is uh, uh, actually a spine surgeon, but he stopped doing spine surgery and he actually looked at pain and what chronic pain is and where it comes from. It's suppressed emotions, for example. And he says the same thing, never relive your pain. Never talk about your pain because every th every time you do, you know these 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 autobahns, as I call them, in your brain, you just make them more profound. You know, you're just going over them again, and you're feeding them again, and they're getting more and more distinct. That relief, yeah, which you have in your brain, gets more profound. And I think it comes a little bit into what you are saying as well. Forgive because it's ultimately good for you. It's healthy for you because you can then turn and really look at you going forward with self-compassion, self-love, self-responsibility, self-awareness, which is the basis, as you say. One issue I wanted to ask you about, I'm a mother. Do you have children? I didn't see that in your no, bio. I don't ah. have children. Okay. okay, okay. I have plenty of animals, no children. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. Well, you know, growing up the way I grew up, <clears throat> I'm being accused of, not accused, I'm, I'm saying that now facetiously, of course, I'm a loving mother, but I wouldn't just, you know, exp um, uh, you know it, describe myself as, as your typical mother. I'm my daughter's friend and coach, right? So putting myself into my mom's shoes, would Victoria come to me, say something about, or somebody said something about my body in a very precious age when the hormones are making you go, you know, haywire or anyway, I would have now, with my consciousness, I would be a self-aware parent, and then I would just say something about the situation. I would not then project onto her what I expect her to do, creating, compounding, but I would be aware of this. My mom was not aware that you could do it, but I think this kind of, that parents have an awful lot of possibility these days to be an enlightened parent and say that, and my husband says, Patricia, not everything is a coaching session, you know? With Victoria, you can just be, you know, you can just say, yeah, flowers are yellow, not because da da da, an absorption of all. No, just, you know, flowers are yellow and it's fine. I disagree with that a bit. Yeah, mm. because I think, especially with children, they have their own character, but you certainly, you're not, you're not changing them, but you're molding into what they are already in a better way or in a conscious way. And I think parents can do a lot to avoid trauma 
if they are aware and projecting onto their child something positive. It's a tricky one. How old is your child? Oh, she's not 18. <laughs> she just turned 18. So she's, she's an adult child about to go to university. But still, you know, I've had her for 18 years. Let's put right, this way. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, the tricky part is that I think these days parents do too much and too little all at the same time. Where they do too much is that they want to do the right thing and they want to really guide in the right direction. But often, and I am always astounded when I work with young people and also when I look at my YouTube channel and I see how many young people are writing me, often the message that they are getting is that there is no freedom that I'm forced to think like my parents, I'm forced to see the world my, like my parents, I'm forced to become like my parents, and I'm afraid of getting old and then finding out that's that. Basically, I've been just living in a, in a cloned way. And that fear is real. This is not just, you know, a little story. They are really traumatized by that fear of, can I live my own life? Do I even have a choice? And that's where there are so many activities, there is so much, you know, expectation and you have to do extracurricular things, you have to be in sports and there's zero time and zero boredom. And so I think there's just not enough freedom for children to feel themselves, to figure themselves out, to ask the questions to themselves without necessarily getting the answers. This, this curiosity that your show is all about that is something we can suffocate by always giving all the answers without letting them be in the void of having simply to not know. Instant gratification, instant answers, instant direction is actually creating a false sense of, well, that must be right. Yeah. And there is no more a questioning inside. There is no more a, a wonderment or just sitting there in, I don't know. And is I don't know okay? I had to get very comfortable with I don't know, especially when my parents were always gone working and I sat at home alone and I don't know when they come back. Will they come back? Will they not come back? What's going to happen? There are a lot of those moments where you had to learn to just hold on to yourself. And I think that's something that we just have to foster in children to give them more that sense of self-reliance and that sense of I can lean on myself. I can find the answers. It may not always be easy. And I may not always be on the right track, but I need to ultimately know what's right for me and what my truth is and not just rely on outside sources to tell me this is how it is. So don't even think about it. I, I love what you're saying. I'm sitting here and whilst I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, does this generation actually have a chance of self or self creation through contemplation? Okay, because you and I, you know, we are the lucky ones in the sense we have the, you know, the analog world as we grew up, and now we we moved into the digital world. It is over, and we still know how it was back then. Now we, we're sounding awfully old, and maybe we are, but you know, we can compare what silence is. Does this generation know silence or because they're always bombarded with whatever and are always given answers, given pictures, giving what they should or should not, you take it away, it becomes physical. You know, they are dopamine addicts unless they have the next hit. They, they're like, oh, my God, I, they don't know themselves that their, their chemistry goes off. I mean, there's so many different aspects, but truly, unless we are somewhere uh, in the woods of Cambodia, does a child in our developed world have a chance to withdraw and have the, the sense to withdraw, to comp contemplate, be bored, oh my God, what luxury, and then to self-create and play with something or build something like we did when we were little? If we give them a chance, yes, and I hope there will be a quote-unquote revolution that young people say, no, we don't want to be little soldiers that are just somehow, you know, fighting for a 401k and a better economy. We want to actually be fulfilled. I mean, I have hope that young uh, people are, you know, feeling inside a drive to have their individualism back and not just become somehow, you know, a cookie in a cookie cutter form. But I also am scared in regards to the diagnosing of children of ADHD, you have anxiety, you need medication, and that we are dragging them to submission. 
and at the end to function and not really to be themselves. And that is where we have to be very, very mindful that anxiety, whatever they are feeling, is not something that immediately needs to go into, well, let's just shut it down. Because if you shut down one emotion, you shut down many emotions. If you are turning off your guidance system, well, where do you go? So just one thing that I wanted to mention before, when you said about my journey and uh, and I think one advantage I had is that anxiety wasn't so stigmatized when I grew up and that it wasn't automatically a problem. It was more like anxiety is a feeling, but there wasn't so much talk about you have to be afraid of this anxiety and, oh, when does anxiety come back? And, oh, you have to live with your anxiety, your anxiety, this is your burden. It was more like, what does it do here? Why is it there? I don't understand it. And so this anxiety was much more understood as a pain that must have a reason to be there than as a misfiring in myself that just has no use and no purpose. And so when young people have anxiety and immediately are told, well, yes, I guess you have to just have a medication here to make you feel better and not have the anxiety as this inner voice that says, you are way away from yourself. You are living on TikTok and not inside of yourself. You are doing what you're supposed to do, but you're actually not living your passion. That's what the anxiety in my case and in many of my clients' cases has been saying. And if we are not listening anymore, yes, naturally, we have no chance because we're turning off one of the most important inner navigators that we have, our emotions. And with our emotions, it's hard to find ourselves. Yeah, and I think these emotions, it's okay to have emotions. And I think, to be honest with you, as I, I see it a little bit, you know, you were talking about anxiety, it wasn't so stigmatized. Nowadays, kind of like, ooh, when Victoria says, I feel anxious, I say, no, you're feeling excited. <laughs> you know, you're feeling excited. So I'm trying to say, like, there's, there's a lot of energy in feeling anxious. Yes, so, so let definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and so I, I think that, again, you can somehow help give a tool as a parent. But I'm thinking also the way we live as parents these days, Do we are suppressing our emotions. How can we then give guidance to our children not doing it? So I the first thought when you said, you know, uh, most of the young people that come to me and see me, they are scared of not being able to be free, to break free of what is expected of them, especially by their parents. I'm like thinking... Are they still connected to their parents? I mean, the parents don't even understand them anymore because they don't know how to spell TikTok, okay? And mm. they live through TikTok. So I thought there was more and more of a generational disconnect because a lot of people in my generation, they are not so into it or don't want to be too into the digital revolution, what have you. And so the drift, the generational drift accelerates as the as the development of technology accelerates, I think. Right. You know, you, right. I, I'm quite sure there's a positive cor correlation there. But I just wonder if I am not a full parent in the sense of I can allow emotions and sometimes I feel shit and that's okay. Yeah. And uh, how can I then allow my child or tell my child it's okay to feel like that? Tell me more. I mean, that's where parents have a responsibility also to come back to themselves. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean that you are well rounded or that you know yourself or that you're living, you know, in your in your freedom to be your own individual. Most parents also are adults that have made a thousand compromises and just, you know, biting them way themselves through time and hoping that when the kids are of the house, when we're retired, when this and this, maybe then I can be happy. So we are postponing happiness. We are postponing purpose and certainly our passion. So yes, it's definitely parents need to also look inside of themselves and say, how can I be a, a better role model? How can I have more courage and be myself and show through this? Yes, it's okay to have emotions, make changes, uh, do things that may not be acceptable right away by society, but they are right for you. So go for it. And things like that. That's where the courage is uh, certainly asked from the parents as well. Yes, I love that, and I, I want to I want to uh, get a little bit deeper into that. But something you also write in your in your book is um, the difference between responding and reacting. And you know, I have a friend, and she is on the phone to me, and she has two children uh, between eight and thirteen. Lone mother, hugely under stress. She works 
children are going to school, what have you, normal life. Like 99.9% of the of the population is is like constantly uh, on demand, and she she comes on the phone, <clears throat> excuse me, in the evening, and she says, "Oh my God, I screamed at my kids again, I screamed at my kids," again. and I know. And so the hour of the evening comes, she starts, you know, quietening down. The the whole cortisol crap is starting to settle down. She's kind of even and calm, a little bit more unstressed through whatever tool, not to be judged. She comes on to, to the phone to me and says, Patricia, I don't know. Again, I scream. I, I, I told myself I would not. So here, rationally, she knows she needs to respond rather than react when the kids are getting on her nerves or doing something yeah. wrong or fighting. But in that moment, Dr. Friedemann, she just cannot. She goes back into the reptile brain instead of taking that back and telling them, no, 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 whatever. It's a tall task. But she suffers it. She knows it. Yet she can't let loose of it in the moment. That's difficult. It's difficult, but it's also, you know, something that you would say if it happens over and over again, why are you not preparing your reptile brain, your uh, subconscious to the next time that gets triggered? You know, it's, it's ultimately her probably doing the best she can, just staying on top of everything, but at the same time also feeling quite uh, out of control at times, especially if there are a lot of demands and all of them want her attention at the same time. So she's well spent coming home. And then you have kids screaming and then you feel like, okay, the only way to get control is to do what I cannot allow myself at work, which is screaming and yelling and, you know, taking the charge here. And she could just also allow herself to come up with what would responding mean? How would that be? What could I do? How can I have boundaries without yelling? How can I have a connection before kids want my attention? Why do they actually act up? Is there something inside of them that they are telling me that I'm not getting? Do they want simply me, my time, my energy in any form, and I'm just not there for them? And what if I would give it to them before they are so needy that they are acting up and bring me to the point of yelling. So these are things when they repeat themselves two, three times, they're all our responsibility to find a way to respond. It's not anything where we have to blame a part of our brain or subconscious while it always somehow gets in my way. No, it just does what it does until we're teaching it to do something different. And this is what you were saying about the empowerment of yourself, the empowerment solution. Last couple of questions. Um, and I'm springing them on you. Uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> none of this is ever prepared anyway on Mentory TV. But um, have you been following the story of previous Prince Harry and Meghan and the release <laughs> of his book? More or less, like everybody else, I like, guess. Uh, that, that's that's enough for me because you're still an expert. You're not like everybody else. I wonder if he came into your uh, practice, sat down in front of you, what would you say to him? Where you think he is right now, Harry? And uh, what he could do to maybe get into a better place? Because it's, I think, quite obvious to the world that he's not in such a comfortable place. I would ask him first 100 questions before I even would say anything to him because I really don't know what's inside of him. From the outside, I think he is in a conflict state. I think there is definitely a part of him that feels resentful and feels angry at what happened to him and uh, how he was forced to be someone or live in a life that you know he necessarily didn't choose you could say i think there is a lot of pain from the loss of his mother that he hadn't dealt with i think there is a lot of resentment towards his father who seemed to be more cold there is jealousy towards his brother who was just the firstborn i mean there are lots of emotions that i would want to know if they're really there or not but that's just a, a thought and i think there is a lot of conflict with his wife i think there is just a constant who is my and who is my loyalty towards, towards my place where I'm born in and, you know, the people that raised me, but then not necessarily let me be myself or towards my wife that, you know, she seems to accept me for who I am and she gives me more attention and guidance than anyone before, but she doesn't seem to be happy with 
what happened to her. And I think he's pulled apart in this way. And I would want to talk to Megan too, because I feel like she's also pulled apart in many ways because she definitely did not, you know, plan this, but I think it's her reaction to her own uh, also childhood and her childhood trauma and uh, feeling also pulled apart in how she has been seen as a star, but then also seen as, you know, a person of color and all those things are her inner conflicts. I mean, I think the issue is that we just don't know how they really feel. And as a society, we, you know, try to see the clues, the books, the interviews, and then we're going to create some kind of judgment around it. I think there may be suffering. I think it's a lot of looking for who do I need to be and what do I really need to hold on to and how much of my past is now haunting me. And mm -hmm. But in the end, I wish them peace. I wish them, you know, some sense of coming back to themselves. So maybe they should read my book and and have a little bit of, you know, reconnecting and forgiveness and all the things that I'm writing about. That would be a wonderful thing to do. And if they ever want to talk to me anytime, call me up. I'm happy to. <laughs> but, <laughs> Absolutely. So Harry and Megan, that's I'm the book. For you. <laughs> Amazing book. But you know, when you were just uh, talking, I thought it's it's interesting. Yeah. I, oh, I also think I also think it's two people uh, individually pulled apart. But but from outside again, you never know what's yeah. going on behind. But you know, in the documentary, I just saw two people pulled apart, pulling together, and that at least in the documentary, what we can judge from outside, uh, was already awesome to me because outside pressure, especially when it comes to family or money or kids, is what splits you know, people, couples. And so far, they've been kind of getting closer together and maybe history repeats itself considering um, the, the past history. Last yes, question. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Last question. And that is, Dr. Friedemann, if you had the chance, what would you tell your 11-year-old self today when you felt something actually really changed in your life, as you described in, in your book? Well, that's yeah, one of the exercises in the book to actually meet your 11-year-old self. For me, 11 was the time where I lost my innocence, where I became all of a sudden aware of I'm not... Uh, accepted as the happy-go-lucky child, I have to perform. Uh, you know, I would definitely tell this child that it's important to hold on to what you know is true. You know, the magic inside of you, the magic that you know exists, the magic of you. Don't ever let anyone tell you that this is not enough or that this is not anything that is desirable or fitting in always look for how you can nourish this magic and and make it easy in your life i made it way too hard that's why i had so many detours i mean i'm not regretting them but look at what you're naturally really passionate about what you're naturally good at what makes you feel like this is where i'm drawn to and go for this there is a reason why you like the things you like there's a reason why you naturally can talk to people there is a reason why you love the magic of nature and and it's in you know innate wisdom all of those things that i knew and that i forgot and i had to remember i would tell the 11 year old just don't forget you can listen to other people it's fine you can take it all in with a grain of salt and but make sure that you remember who you are is enough no matter what and I, I had to relearn to be enough for myself 35 years later. 35 years later. And if anybody wants a shortcut, <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is definitely it. You know, you don't need to go through 35 years later, even though I do believe I do believe that there's a lot of gain in pain. But you can kind of like try to shorten the pain that we all have. And Dr. Friedemann, thank you so much. We went through, I think, a good chunk, but not half of what people can get out of your book, your work in general, be it online, be it uh, as a practitioner, uh, with your two, two books as well learning about what's going on but the basic i think which we try to communicate and you try to communicate as well is be self-aware if you have anxiety don't just you know don't just take a pill 
don't go and and have a joint. Don't go and and you know drink or do any or lash out. Just say, hey, why am I feeling this? I am feeling this when da da da. And start kind of the self discovery, which is painful, which may be ugly, but it does it does bring you someplace else, perhaps, and it makes you realize that where you were wasn't so great. Okay, and you don't need to have OCD or any kind of other uh, type of, um, you know, pathology or illness that that comes out of it. So thank you so, so much for your time. Um, Awesome conversation, awesome book, awesome person. Thank you very much. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community. Uh, I know. You know, self-awareness, trying to stay grounded with yourself, trying to listen to your inner voice is hard because most of the time we just lost our inner voice and we have to kind of rediscover it. How Dr. Friedemann just said, you need to dig. Keep on digging because there's so much gold inside of the digging after you get all the dirt out. You know, I mean, come on, it's fine. But, uh, you know, get the book, go into the podcast, listen to Dr. Friedemann call him. I think it's one of the most amazing books and work. I've come across huge value. And thank you again for staying curious. Thank you for your support. We've got more and more subscribers. The more subscribers, the better the guests. So stay with us here on the channel and stay curious. See you next time. Bye. Together, go out there. Together.